many of the core crises and imbalances that we are facing right now can be traced to a lack of connection or relationship. Ideologies and socialization processes that have taught humans to consider themselves separate from the places that they live, separate from the planet they live on, separate from other human beings, human beings who may not come from the same places or look like us. The myth of separation is deeply rooted, at least in westernized thinking and thought, and the goal of Weaving Earth is to dismantle some of that thinking and thought and really get at some of the socialization that is actually very inaccurate about who we are as beings on this planet, and then remember who we actually are as beings on this planet, as interconnected, interrelated parts of a whole system that is the Earth we live on, as well as the communities that we live in. Hello and welcome. My guest today, Will Scott, was evacuated from the Kincaid fire when we had this conversation last week. I want to share an update that Will has returned to his home. The fire is now almost completely contained. It has been reported that 77,758 acres were consumed by the fires, including 374 structures and 174 homes. Will shared that life is getting back to quote-unquote normal, except there is an increasing feeling that what was once normal is now a memory. He says, We are living on a climate change front line, and while there's plenty of fear, there is also some excitement in the air about how to respond as such. We share our thoughts and prayers by all affected by this and other disasters or conflicts right now. We do have some really good news to share, which is that fracking has been banned in the UK. Thank you to all the incredible activists who were dedicated and persistent in their protests, who held the government accountable when they overruled local democratic decisions and did not give up. Thank you to those protesters who went to jail to prevent fracking and the communities who supported them. It is possible that this is only a pause for the general election, so this might not be over, but still, something to celebrate for a moment, and at least it's being recognised as an election issue. We have been thinking a lot about community and the importance and need of what it offers. It comes up a lot in this conversation. You are all welcome to join our patron community. We have our call this Sunday. All you have to do is go to the community page on our website, www.thefutureisbeautiful.co, and make a monthly donation. This supports us to keep making the show and bring you these conversations. And you get to be part of this global community. Join the video calls and the chat group and meet other amazing people that are part of this show. In addition to this, we are starting to gather you, our community, regionally for regular meetups with other listeners where you can talk about the issues raised in the podcast and connect. The first of these will take place in Topanga in Los Angeles this weekend, where I will be visiting and we'll go on a hike together. All are welcome. And then we'll host another in the Bay Area before the end of this month. To stay connected with these, find out more by writing in joining our newsletter or in our Facebook group. And if you want to host a gathering, write to us and we will share it in our newsletter and groups to help gather people, bring people together and create community around all of these issues and ideas and just the way in which we're able to support each other. We also have Presence Collective, which is a facilitated online space we have monthly themes which correlate to what we explore in the podcast and I distill them down into clear workshops to resource you as well as practices to embody what we talk about here. You get to be part of a very supportive and loving global community and we have tree whispers and a book club and more. It's an incredibly beautiful space. I would love for you to try it. And so this month you can join at any of the three price tiers we have for 50% off. Each tiers offers the same, but it's a sliding scale to make it accessible. If you want to join us, click on courses on our website and use the code TFIB community. We were just looking at how to transform eco anxiety into eco grief and then into the love and activism we need. It was very powerful and I would love for you to be part of this if it resonates. When you join, you get access to all of the themes that we've explored before 
and really a very, very supportive community of care and practice. I am also opening up my mentoring program at the moment. If you want one-to-one leadership with me for the next six months, it's very powerful if you're moving through a transition in your life or in your inner being. You can find out more information if you go to www.amisha.co.uk and click on leadership. For today's interview, we have Will Scott, who I met at Bioneers last month. He is a co-founder and lead facilitator at the Weaving Earth Centre for Relational Education, which is a pioneering organisation in the area of holistic education, working at the crossroads of social and environmental systems change through restoring, remembering and cultivating an embodied awareness of our interrelationship with people and planet. In this conversation, we explore the question, how can we reconnect deeply to ourselves, our community and our planet? I hope that you enjoy this episode. And as always, we love to hear from you. So do write in and share what's moving you. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. It's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. This is the revolution. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I am delighted to welcome you, Will, onto the show. Thank you so much for making time today amidst all of the chaos. Yeah, you're welcome. It's it's a pleasure to be here. So we're in a, a quite unique moment for you. And just to give some context to our friends listening, that we are sitting here in Marin County in Northern California, where there's currently no power in the whole county um, due to prevention of fires. And further north of that, there have been some big evacuations, including your home, Mm -hmm. due to the fire that's taking place up there. Yeah. That's true. That's the circumstance we're in today. We're sitting in the bedroom of my friend's daughter who are out of town. And so this house is a place to be for folks who had to leave Sonoma County, myself included. It's fire season in Northern California. And I think I heard this morning that hundreds of thousands of people now are evacuated from the North Bay. Northern Bay Area, Northern California, uh, due to the Kincaid fire, which is still burning and very little of it is contained. Big winds came yesterday and are predicted to come again tomorrow, which is partly why so many are evacuated to get out of the potential pathway of those winds. How does it feel right now to be away from your home and to to kind of hold that possibility of what might happen um, to your home and to your belongings and to your community? It feels frightening, certainly. The low level of anxiety feels deeply rooted in my body right now and in the body of the collective, like many people. You can just feel it, Um, this sense of not knowing It also feels slightly liberating in a way to, you know, be asked. I didn't actually get to go home and pack my things. I was already gone when the evacuation mandate came. So I had to tell friends what I needed and to realize what a short list that was of things that are really essential and how many things that, you know, belong to me were not on that list. 
And I've talked to a lot of people who are having that same experience of like, wow, we, what actually mattered fit into like a box, you know, a couple boxes maybe. And the rest is, I'm sure it would be sad if it went. And the idea that it could go and the idea of entire communities possibly just being engulfed in flame, which did happen here a couple years ago, is terrifying. And I certainly don't wish that on anyone, but it is a good mirror for the sort of capitalist world of things that we accumulate. And then the recognition that like the most important ones are usually pretty few. What, what kind of belongings were like, you and your friends sharing that were kind of coming up in that, what we needed to be in that box? Well, there's this sort of obvious, you know, necessary, quote unquote, things like passports and documents and hard drives, you know, with backup of things, those, those kinds of things. But then everything else was at the level of handmade items. Or like for me, I have a painting that my father got from his mother and that I got from my father when he died. And it's a like, that's the most important thing, probably, more than my passport, which I also got. It was, you know, I talked to a friend who's a California native basket weaver, and, you know, his car's full of baskets. That's what he got, and um, other handmade items. And I, I am lucky to work with my hands and with people who care deeply about craft. And so a lot of people I've talked to got their crafts and their precious items that are not replaceable, you can't go out and buy those again. So it was those kinds of things that people were grabbing. Yeah. I had an, an interesting experience just being here and being in, in Marin um, when the power went off. And because the fires weren't close, and people went evacuated, but it was like this comfort was being turned off. This kind of strange relationship with like how seriously to take it, mm -hmm. especially when you know you can just drive half an hour across the bridge and be in San Francisco where everything's running normally. And it's kind of got me thinking quite a lot about, you know, because we talk a lot about what's going to happen in the future and there might be more natural disasters or there might be a shortage of this or that. Mm. Or, and, and what I found really interesting was, yeah, I guess like the short-term thinking. So a friend of a friend, like instead of wanting to eat the food in the freezer, wanted to find out like what takeaway was open and was delivering food. <laughs> you know, who's, someone must have a generator kind of thing. And I was like, but there's so much food here that's like going to go bad. And I went into one of the towns and there's one store that had a generator and I kind of just went in to see what was going on. And, and I just saw loads of people with coffee cups and it wasn't even like cappuccinos. It was just filter coffee because that was like all that, you know, was being made. Um, but this sense that people were coming out for filter coffee and then also were buying like a soup that they could eat right then and there or a salad box or something. And just this very like short term thinking. And of course, part of it is also that desire to be out of the house and to just mm. to touch base with other people that live close by and see who's out and what, what they're doing and how they're managing it. And, and that kind of thing of like, oh, do I like, cancel everything am I still you know am I meant to get myself to San Francisco to make sure I show up for my client meetings that are, I need wi-fi for mm -hmm. or like you said that there's wi-fi at, at Target so people are going to Target to do their business meetings or send the urgent emails or do the online banking that needs to be done mm -hmm. I what I noticed especially on Saturday which was the day that um, at least where I am at, a lot of the evacuation warnings and then mandatory evacuation started to sort of roll through in stages. And I was already in Marin County, so I was a county south. And 
there was a stark difference between the reality and the urgency that all my friends and community in in Sonoma County were experiencing and what, you know, 40 minutes away we were experiencing in Marin County where there wasn't this mandatory or even possibility at that point of an evacuation. And it just felt like two different worlds. And I had friends who were with me here in Marin County who just felt like this doesn't feel like anyone here is actually taking this seriously at all. You know, we're going home. And I was teaching that day, so I had to stay, but I was calling and texting my friends at, you know, this short list of like, well, here's what you got to grab for me. And every time I got on the phone with anyone in Sonoma County, there was just this stress, anxiety, urgency, realness. And then I would go back to where I was in Marin County and it was, everyone was kind of relaxing and having a nice afternoon and very, I was teaching at an event that was like part education and activism, but also part celebration and like a little bit of a party. So I was kind of at a party while 45 minutes away, people's lives are on fire. And it was a very surreal, strange experience. And that thing you're talking about of sort of, how do we be with this? And at what, how close does it have to get before we need to start really thinking about what are we going to do? And to me, it felt very close and people didn't seem to be thinking a lot about it in that moment, at least. I think they are now more because the power went off everywhere. So there's a little bit more reality. But even that for many people, they can get in a car and and go to San Francisco. So they just go 40 minutes south again. And right. Like all the gas stations are closed here in Marin. And so those that have like the means will go where there's gas and they'll go where there's power and they'll go where there's Wi-Fi. And then of course there's a lot of people that are just trying to find like a place where they can sleep that's comfortable and some food. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there are people that are trying to get places but don't have gas. Yeah. Yeah, it just, I feel like we're so, we're so conditioned now to comfort and to our capitalist ways, the mm. get the takeaway, go get the coffee, you know, rather than, oh, like, I'm, I've, I'm going to boil a big pot of water and start giving out tea, like, mm. somewhere or, or whatever it is. And, yeah, sometimes I wonder how we're going to, get out of that if we need to and I think it's quite hard to when we live in a world where like on on one hand we know there's so much injustice and we know there are so many people that are living in poverty or close to these natural disasters that are increasing or war zones and then on the other hand and you know you especially have that if you're around this part of the world where there's all the tech and the innovation and you know but we have all these solutions and and kind of holding these those two possibilities together yeah it, it seems to me that those possibilities have a relationship with each other and You know, there is, it, in this part of the world, you know, Bay Area, California, we do have all of this possibility-making machines are just happening all around us. All this innovation, all of this resource, all of this minds coming up with amazing things. And of course, the reality of that result of the capitalist regime is that you know, all of that can exist side by side with incredible inequity and incredible wealth gaps that are just massive in the Bay Area. And so it's true. Some people are, the effect of this fire is like a major inconvenience for, from all of their comforts. And some people are potentially losing everything they have. Some people can get in a car and drive away or get on a plane and fly away and some people can't and that all exists side by side and is certainly illuminated by a moment like this 
And I think that these fires are one example of the kind of reality check that some of this resource and wealth and innovation might need to push itself into the direction of more livable future. And I know that many are working on those things, but I also know that we have the technology we need. We, we know this, right, to right many of the imbalances that are already well underway, not just environmental ones, but social and political ones as well. But we haven't done it. And this is one of those critical questions of, of us as humans at this time is like, what will it take to actually wake up to a real shift in the way we conduct ourselves? And is it going to be that events like these fires will have to increase and increase and increase until we wake up and respond adequately? Or, or is it possible that we will somehow get it before too many events like these have to happen? And it may be too late for that. You know, the, we're going to get it. It may be too late for that already. I'm curious how all the wealth and innovation and technology and possibility that is here in the Bay Area is impacted or influenced by something like the now perpetual fire season. You know, every year we find ourselves in this. And is it having an influence? Is the fire causing things to heat up in a way that will change the direction of some of that power that exists here. I don't know the answer to that. I hope that it does. And it's interesting that in the in the world that we live in, like I guess this is like the third year that that this has been a kind of oh this is fire season now, mm -hmm. and that still feels relatively new when we would hope to live in a society where there's nearly an incident and we're already <laughs> making the shifts that we need to yeah. rather than letting something happen for five, 10 years before we go, oh, right, we need to create some massive change in all of those systems to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah. Can you tell us what Weaving Earth is and what you've been working on with that project? Weaving Earth is, uh, we call ourselves Weaving Earth Center for Relational Education. And we're a nonprofit organization in Sonoma County, which is Southern Pomo territory in about an hour north of San Francisco. And we have been around for going into seven, eight years now. We were born out of a question how, would, how do you educate for our times? And if we really look at the situation that we're in on the planet right now, and as a species right now, as a human species, what are the tools? What are the capacities? What are the ways of being and knowing? What are the awarenesses that we need to best address what we face? And that question was sort of the driver of a lot of years of working, trying, changing, and evolving curriculum that then became what we're now calling relational education. And I would say that at the heart of Weaving Earth is that question of relationship. And if there's many ways to distill it down, but one way that I always like to distill it down is that many of the core crises and imbalances that we are facing right now can be traced to a lack of connection or relationship. It can be traced to worldviews and ideologies and socialization processes that have taught humans to consider themselves separate from the places that they live, separate from the planet they live on, separate from other human beings, human beings who may not come from the same places or look like us or talk like us. And 
the myth of separation is deeply rooted, at least in westernized thinking and thought. And the goal of Weaving Earth is to both interrogate and dismantle some of that thinking and thought and really get at some of the socialization that is actually very inaccurate and not true about who we are as beings on this planet. And then at the same time, start to remember or make whole again who we actually are as beings on this planet, as interconnected, interrelated parts of a whole system that is the earth we live on, as well as the communities that we live in. So relational education does something very different, I think, than a lot of at least sort of academic learning that I've done, which is that it focuses more on helping to cultivate an embodied feeling and real experience of inner relationship first. And then out of connection, out of relationship, out of understanding ourselves as part of whole systems, then begin to look at those systems and how to move with them in new ways. And do you do this primarily through like programs that that people can join and go on journeys? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we really work mainly as an educational center. So we have homeschool programs for local youth. We have teen programs and then we have adult programs as well. And it is primarily our way of delivering this system of education or this way of educating is through is through experiential community-based nature-based programming we haven't quite figured out how to translate relational education into literature or videos yet because so much of it is about the experience it's like it's relationship happens in real time so that's how we do it and it's all local so it's all kind of serving people in your area in Sonoma County? Currently, yes. Although people come from lots of places, um, but they do have to come to us at this point. And I could certainly imagine it spreading and growing and being able to reach other places. And that is one of the goals of the model is that, you know, for instance, as, as someone who comes to our adult immersion program, which is kind of our biggest offering, it's the one where we're able to do the most comprehensive, holistic delivery of what we're talking about. Uh, One of the hopes and prayers with that program is that people will then take it to their communities and take it into their workplaces and their lives and bring that kind of holistic and relational thinking, being, leadership into other places. Beautiful. I like that it's really locally based, though. And maybe that's also because I've been more in in this world of programs that are very like international and then they also end up being for people that have a certain amount of money that can afford to do Mm -hmm. them or can afford to get to the exotic locations and so yeah I really like that you're bringing all kinds of different people together that live in the same community to the land Mm -hmm. that you live on yeah Yeah, and that's a critical component. So much of our model or the way we approach learning is is through the teachings of the natural world and really looking to this whole system, nature, which we're a part of, as the primary instructor, the primary teacher, the primary one who's really showing us what this whole relational thing is actually about. So it has to be place-based and it can move to other places and be place-based there, but it's important that it lives and breathes on in a community and in a place, in a bioregion. And that building relationship to that place is is a key part of the journey. Beautiful. Yeah. What was it that made this what you dedicated your work to? Hmm. that's a good question (laughs) 
<laughs> it's a big question. It is. It is. <laughs> Personally, the more I paid attention, the more I learned, the more I sort of came of age in the moment in the human story that we live in, the more it became clear to me that, you know, it's been said many times in many ways, but, you know, the the level of thinking that got us into this situation is not going to get us out of it. The, that, that beautiful idea that, that we can't solve a problem at the level of thinking that created it, that new ways of understanding, new ways of being, new ways of approaching are going to be necessary to help us feel, find, learn, emerge, listen, and co-create our way through this moment. And I was lucky in my life to get to come across teachers or influences or the right book at the right time or the right mentor at the right time who kept sort of nudging me the next step towards what that might look like. And was lucky and also privileged to get to do some of my learning out in nature and get mentored out in the natural world and have a father and a mother who also valued getting me outside. So it was there from a young age and then also came at a very pivotal, number of pivotal times for me. And this thing I said before about just looking at how humans are behaving and wondering why, why are we doing this? You know, what got us here? And my tracking of it had, again, had so much to do with this worldview rooted in separation and domination and human superiority, human exceptionalism. And then within that, exceptionalism and superiority and supremacy of certain kinds of humans over other humans. And it just unfolds in this long arc of story that has been causing immense harm and damage and tragedy and atrocity for thousands of years. And so then the question like, well, how do you get under that? How do you get under that story? How do you start to remember stories that are older than that one? And how do you also create conditions for new stories to grow out of it? And that was the kind of possibility I started to see and imagine could be born in a place like Weaving Earth, in, a, in an educational soil that could both decompose and metabolize stories that were not serving and also be nutrient rich and create conditions for emergent new story to be born. And um, that was worth dedicating my life to and my time to. And I think we're doing it. And I also know that we're not doing it perfectly. It's, it's still emerging. That's one thing we've learned about relational education is that it itself needs to continue to change and adapt and be relational to whatever comes next. It will never be a stagnant set model. Can't be. Can you give an example of the kinds of things that you, you do in these journeys? <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to cultivate and remember relationship and our relatedness. And that's an inner process. That's a interpersonal process. It's a interspecies process. It's a transpersonal process. In a program like the Weaving Earth Immersion, which is this adult program that we run, which is nine months long. So it's a, it's a significant investment of time to a process that people give. And people also will stay for a second year and a third year. So there's time. And within that, we're looking at a lot of different areas of curriculum, quote unquote curriculum, that are intersecting. And one of our main sort of goals or orientations to all of the curriculum is that none of it is separate from any other piece. We may focus in a day on how to make medicine off of the landscape and out of our natural 
region that we're in, or we may focus the next day on looking at systems of cis-heteropatriarchy and how the process of colonization is rooted to those systems. And in either of those days, we're not forgetting the other day. And the whole idea that we can address an individual problem as a siloed event, we really want to break out of that. So we're looking a lot at intersections, a lot of social and environmental intersections in particular. And we do lots of different things. So we focus, again, I've said it a lot on the natural world and nature as teacher. So connection to nature and core routines of awareness building and connection building are critical. So we spend a lot of time outside, we spend a lot of time sitting and listening and helping our bodies remember how to pay attention at levels that we often don't get taught how to pay attention in the modern experience. And we like to go animal tracking and we like to help tend to our ecosystems and learn what it is to put the human animal back into the ecosystem as a part of it rather than just an extractive force on top of it. But then we talk about permaculture and regenerative design and we teach about mentoring and how do you pass this on and storytelling and inner tracking and how do you take all of this and then apply it to your own inner landscape and you know do the same kind of thing you might do to regenerate a watershed. You can apply that skill set to your inner watersheds. And we look heavily at social justice and equity and resilience and communication and peacemaking and community connective practices to help us learn how to be with each other again as human beings. So big interwoven bundle of teachings and we're not even touching a lot of what we could be. So sometimes I think of it as like we're just trying to remember how to be good humans again and that's really a lifelong process. If we do our job well, we'll make ourselves obsolete and we won't need programs to educate like that anymore because we'll just be doing it again. That's a goal of ours, to make ourselves obsolete. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this, a lot of it is like an, an unlearning process mm -hmm. of the things that have caused the separation Yeah. where we've become separate from the ecosystem. Yeah. I know that you've been on your path and studying and holding space for a long time now. What are some of like the, the most pivotal moments or experiences in your own unfolding and learning? Hmm. Well, a few things come to mind. Maybe I can put them in some kind of a sequential order. I'm not sure. One was being, one was the first time that I was lucky enough to go on an extended trip into, you know, the wilderness, as we call it. Although I know a lot of people who are, you know, we're not so sure about that word anymore because even the idea of wilderness perpetuates an idea of separation. Like the wilderness is where the people aren't. And, good teachers of mine say, well, the wilderness is where the people have stopped tending. They've stopped interacting. So, but I went on a trip in college that was at that time called the wilderness trip. And I encountered parts of myself that I had never had access to in the modern world. And then shortly after that, I, I was very curious what happened. Like, why did I feel the way I did out there? And why did I feel so much different once I'd come back? And I wanted the thing that I had found out there to be true in my daily life, but it wasn't. And I researched and looked and searched and found this field called eco-psychology, which was looking at the human relationship to place. And that was a pivotal mo moment for me because I suddenly found other people who were talking about what I was trying to learn about. What did you feel out there? Uh, what I felt out there was truly comfortable in my own 
skin in my own body and my own self, you know, probably for the first time since I was maybe a kid, certainly the first time in my young adult life, I felt calm. I felt, I felt like my dedication and care for the place I was in was this alive and living reciprocal relationship that was just nourishing to the core and and demanding of me as well like i needed to show up for it and i felt deep ease and connection with the people i was with as well a small group of people who had been traveling together you know a manageable circle where you really could know what was happening with everybody because it wasn't so many relationships that you couldn't track it all so i felt peace and like i had come home And I didn't know that I had felt that to the degree that I did until I got back. It was some weeks after being back when I just realized like, well, everything that I thought I had gotten out there or opened to out there suddenly felt very distant. And that was like a a frightening moment. And I think some other pivotal moments along my path were um, moments of meeting certain teachers, certain people who have had significant influence. The moment I first encountered the work of human development, especially through the lens of uh, rites of passage and honoring transitions that we move through as a human life, as we move through a human life, and looking at what it is to attend to those and recognizing that we, I, grew up in a society that doesn't do that very well, and therefore there's a lot of um, uninitiated, grown human people running things. And also very pivotal moments on my path when I also started to realize just how lucky and privileged I was, and there's a moment where I'm like, oh, I'm white. Like, no one told me that, you know, and what that actually means. And, you know, no one told me about the unearned privileges that I have as a straight cis man. So reckoning, you know, and reckoning with the real history of how I got to be who I am, where I am, which is not the history I was taught in school. You know, the history I was taught in school didn't do a very good job of telling a true story. So those are also pivotal moments, painful ones that I'm still living into all the time. Who are some of the teachers that have had the the most impact on you? It sounds like you have been surrounded by a lot of amazing, wise people. Yeah, I'm super lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am. I don't quite know how it happened because it just kind of felt like I was following my nose, you know, and, and then I would meet someone and then that would lead me to someone else. And But a lot of, again, you know, a lot of opportunity an opportunity that a lot of other people maybe don't get in the same way. They may get other opportunities that I didn't, but certainly some some significant opportunities came my way. Uh, one of the first ones was meeting and finding an organization. This goes back to the work of honoring transition and rites of passage. Um, I found the School of Lost Borders, and from from within this small enclave of people who run that organization out in Eastern California. I met many mentors and teachers who were very significant. I could name a list. And one who really has continues to and has had a major, major impact is a woman named Gigi Coyle. Gigi, I met through that work with the School of Lost Borders, um, but then much beyond as well and ended up getting to join her in a number of journeys and 
pilgrimages and deep, deep mentorship. So I, I would, you know, her name pops out. Stephen Foster and Meredith Little are the ones who founded the School of Lost Borders, and, and the school is looking to bring nature-based and wilderness-based rites of passage back into the modern world. John Young is another significant teacher who I came across completely accidentally. And it was right after I'd been deeply, deeply studying eco-psychology and really focused on like the human relationship to place and how that gets broken and how it can be mended. And I stumbled on John and felt like I had found John as a, a tracker and a mentor and really has done deep work with looking at how do people remember connection and awaken their innate sense of connectedness. You know, we are actually at our core, human beings are very, very good at connection. Deeply, deeply, deeply wired to be in exquisite relationship. And John really went after how, how does that get remembered? How do we do that again when we've been severed from it, at least taught to be severed from it? And so I found him and I was like, oh my God, applied eco-psychology. Like, this is like not theoretical anymore. This is how you do it in your body, which was profound. Mia Cota Taylor, uh, who works with an organization called Fierce Allies here in the Bay Area, a very powerful and strong teacher for me, really looking at how do we get into and dismantle and interrupt these systems of power and privilege, no matter where we find ourselves on that spectrum, how do we take responsibility and show up? Dear, dear teachers and mentors from the University of Vermont, Two Trees and Matt Colin, also longtime mentors and teachers looking at how systems of oppression intersect with environmental movements and where that is you know needing some real interrogation and what it is to be a nature education organization early on in in you know before weaving earth was even born uh, the two of them were such deep influences to help us look at what are we doing here and how do we do it in a way that is actually accountable to the legacies that we've inherited I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I wanted our friends listening to have some extra references, you know, maybe to discover some yeah. some teachers or some books that they hadn't yet come across. Cool. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Amisha. We are just taking a little break from the conversation here. On behalf of myself and the team, I want to say thank you for being part of creating a beautiful future. We make this for you so that we will all have the vision, wisdom and activism we need at this time to weave a new narrative. Can you help us with this? You can do that by making a monthly donation to the podcast to cover our costs. Just the equivalent of a fair trade banana you might eat or a chai latte you might drink whilst you listen to this will make a huge difference to us. Head to www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community to become a monthly patron. And the other thing is to tell your friends about this podcast so they can tune in too. Send them a message or post on social media and let them know what you love about it. And whilst you're at it, leave us a review. And now, back to the conversation. Thank you for your loving beauty. I really resonate with what you shared about that first experience of, of being in the wilderness and, and then the coming back. And I feel like I've had that experience so many times by taking part in certain group journeys or adventures or training programs and then and feeling that deep togetherness you know where you you live in the same place and you have all your meals together and you 
you spend all day together and you get to know people really well like mm-hmm. what makes them tick like where their strengths are where their weaknesses are like how to support them they learn how to support you and you have this experience of of really feeling part of something and then you go home and for me that going home has i've never managed to create a home that feels like that i guess that's my my dream is that home is that and mm. so if i've gone and done something amazing i'm coming back to something just as amazing but i guess i even had that uh, last night having left like a really beautiful home i was staying in where we were sharing meals and where we were talking a lot and where there was such a kind of weave of practices and values then there was no power so there was like a really collective experience and then i went by myself to a room that i had booked mm-hmm. a month in a- ago <laughs> and then was sitting <laughs> in this room by myself being like this doesn't feel right like this doesn't this feels sad and it's not like it's not because i'm really sad and i was like and i wasn't facing myself when i was with them you know because there's so much of this in like the new age world right. of like because of course i can happily sit with myself in my discomfort and i can sit in complete bliss by myself but that that contrast you know give me a day or two and i will will have adjusted and i'll be back in all of the the postures that i need in order to not feel that separation but yesterday i really felt that separation and it was diwali and i was thinking i want to be in the house eating dal in mm-hmm. candlelight mm-hmm. <laughs> sharing the yeah. mythology and the mantras and and being with people yeah and being with you know these people in particular because that's where all the cells in my body had just been had just attuned and it's not easy to then like have to just let that go and then like reform and I don't know what my question is exactly. I guess my question is something around how have you found ways to be more resilient with that integration process? Yeah, I mean, this is the million dollar question. Oh, great. Does yeah. that mean we get a million dollars? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You ask that question and you immediately get a million dollars <laughs> to go and build cultural sanctuary halfway houses for people who need integration space yeah maybe we just build a world where <laughs> we don't need to integrate right. from right. from community experiences yeah we yeah. need we'd need more than a million for that we would yeah or we would need to just start doing it like you say yeah. and just create it and live it and and it's it is hard and even in situations where there is much more strong intact community it has been known as part of the human experience that the step of integration the you know the point where you have to bring the transformation or the change or the gift back home to the community is known to be the most perilous part of the journey it's the most difficult step and that's even when there's a good community there who knows that you went and why you went and that you went not just for yourself but for the people and for the earth and they're ready to welcome you back and it's still known that it's going to be hard to integrate it mm. so then here we are in a world where so often if we have a moment of rapture or a moment of insight or a revelatory experience or just a simple time of community belonging and feeling like oh this feels good in my system when we attempt to integrate it there is very little support people don't know why you would want to do that or what it is to or how to even meet you as you come back so i do think this is actually a one of the million dollar questions i don't know if i like a million dollar because it's but it's it's a very important valuable and kind of critical question 
I think it's also maybe this question is one of the reasons why here we are with all of these solutions and all of the knowing of what we need to do to turn things towards a more life-enhancing and just and beautiful world, and yet we keep somehow not doing it. Mm. Or at least at the big, you know, it's taking so long, you know, like if we were better at receiving and metabolizing and actually allowing ourselves to be affected and impacted by real insight or vision or information that comes back from the the dreamers and the the ones who are really looking for the answers or the ones who come with something if we knew how to integrate and take it in would we be moving a little quicker towards some of the kinds of change that are needed Mm. yeah because i guess at the moment a lot of people that are going on those quests because they have to right that's what if they they listen to their hearts it's what is being called but for many people they get home and a lot of what they've just experienced is kind of judged as as nonsense Mm -hmm. the worst kind of you know edge of it and I mean I'm hosting an online community partly because I wanted to give those people a space of of togetherness Mm. even if they don't have it like with people in their local area or or access to it for whatever reason but it's yeah it's one of these these kind of tricky tricky aspects of of modern living and I I just really felt it last night and then I noticed all of these I started to have the impulse to order a pizza and Mm -hmm. the impulse to get a beer Mm -hmm. and the impulse to watch a movie and I was like I've been eating so well I have I haven't wanted to drink alcohol for ages I've been writing not like watching and then and then I had to kind of like you know, wrestle a little bit with all of those impulses. And I was like, okay, no pizza, no beer, but I will watch a movie. (laughs) (laughs) And and then almost like that kind of, ah, I've got to numb out of this slightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it just makes me think of what gets lost because this is part of the, you can't, use your relational education if you're not in spaces where you can relate Mm -hmm. right or where that where that relating is welcome right yeah finding more and more of those spaces making more of those spaces where that desire for meaningful communication and community and i guess communication is is really honored Mm -hmm. And it's just interesting, the the going out on the journeys and then the coming back and how do we integrate as we come back, which is part of it. It's part of it. But then I also think there is very alive, already happening places of incredible insight. And a lot of the information we need is is emerging. And you don't have to go do a workshop. In fact, a lot of the places it's emerging from, you're not going to go do a workshop. It's coming out of the reality of what we've created for ourselves. You know, I said it the other day about these fires burning. It's like, yes, PG&E started that fire, but we built that fire. The project of capitalism and imperialism and colonization built that fire. It's built many fires and many front lines and many places where what we know is needed is is right there in front of us and the voices have been saying it and so there's another kind of integration too of how do we actually hear what is already loud and not go off on the big journey to find the next piece of it but also honor the pieces that are just like aching to be heard and integrated. You know, there's a there's like we need to learn to listen again. And 
make room and be willing to shift and change so that the actual transformation of ourselves as being, but also of the structures and the systems can happen. So I love that you like wrestled with the numbing agents, you know, that wanted to come in last night. I know that place really well. And, you know, instead of just habitually going to them, you caught it. It's like such a good, another one of my teachers. I actually felt bad because I feel like, oh, there's all these other teachers. I want to keep going with my list. But a, <laughs> a really, really beautiful and important man named Paul Rayfield, who's an Odala man from the Great Lakes region. And he's taught so much and offered so much. And one of the things he offers is it's an integration tool is to learn to catch your pattern. And first you learn it after it's happened. You know, you would have learned it like the pizza and the beer would have been in hand and you would have been enjoying it. And then you might have been like, oh shit, I did that. Or like four four days later. Or Yeah, exactly. Or a week later yeah. after many pizzas and beers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh wait, what happened? <laughs> exactly. And then you might catch it like while you're chewing the pizza and drinking the beer and be like, oh, I'm doing it right now. You know, I'm numbing. I'm not letting myself listen and integrate and feel. And then you might have the night like last night where it's like, wait, I'm not going to, I there's the impulse and I'm not going to do it. And that's a key moment in the integration journey. And that's the level that we have to start paying attention, both to our own inner patterns and also to the patterns that are happening around us. Like when we catch ourselves perpetuating whatever that thing is, can we then stop and take a pause and get good enough at that so that then we catch ourselves before we do it? It's hard work in a world that's moving as fast as this world is. The desire to just have a beer and eat some pizza and just oh, chill out is strong because it's so much coming in all the time. You know, we also need to support each other in it. We need accountability buddies to catch us. Or at least somebody to have the beer and the pizza with. Right. <laughs> <laughs> at least talk about it over a beer and some pizza. Yeah. I don't want to demonize beer and pizza either because no, I, it has its place. No, for sure. And the only reason that that was a, an issue for me was because I was coming from a place where I had been really paying attention to, to what I was putting in my body and I had been doing a lot of yoga asana and I was just, and I, and I was writing a lot mm. and all of that was feeling really good. And so when those those other ideas came in last night, they felt like disruptive forces. They didn't feel like a natural longing for a beer or a pizza. Right. And that's the difference. Right. Because, because there can also be unhealthy longings for the, the so-called healthy things. Absolutely. And so it's not, but it's like I knew that that was because I was feeling sad. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was feeling like, oh, I want to be where I was. <laughs> right. And so, right. yeah. And so feeling that, that, And I just know that so many of our friends listening can relate to to that, to that those kind of impulses, mm -hmm. and, and that bit of yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about some of the rites of passage that you've discovered that have been important for you? Yeah. I've begun to get interested in, and also more trying to be more also precise with some of the language around it too, because my, my understanding, the way I, I've sort of studied it and also been taught, I think of a rite of passage as something that usually will take place within more of an intact community. And it's not something that you just kind of sign up for. It's something where you will be moving through and developing as an individual over time within a context and a, co a community context and at a moment when there is one of those deep changes, like from adolescence into young adulthood, for instance, people in that community will know that 
and they will be watching and they will then say, okay, it's time to formally mark this. And the entire fabric of the community will change as a result because then there will be one less adolescent and there will be one more young adult in that fabric. That's one of the things when we live in a world that has, you know, really, in the, in, at least in the industrialized growth society, as Joanna Macy likes to call it, we've lost community. In, in fact, we've like very strategically ripped community apart and uplifted the individual and not the community unit. So I don't know that we get often, at least, um, so many rites of passage in that kind of intact way. But we still go through transitions. The human moves through stages as it grows and evolves. And so I like to think of honoring transitions. And some of the work that I've been lucky enough to be a part of is, you know, how do we find meaningful ways of meeting people when they are at that moment of change, uh, that moment of transition, and to mark it, to celebrate it, to honor it, to witness it, and to make real the shift that is happening internally with some kind of external validating uh, experience that is both difficult and also safe, or safe enough, at least. That can look a lot of ways, and depending on the transition that someone is in, it may need to look different ways. So the work that I've done with nature-based, wilderness-based rites of passage in a place like School of Lost Borders, really part of the honoring of the transition and part of the marking, no matter what the transition is, will include uh, the mirror of the natural world and giving ourselves to nature to carry the question or to carry the prayer or the intention that we're marking out into that bigger field of listening and relationship and not try to tell anyone what they need to do or how they need to do it, but rather trust that the innate wisdom of the individual in concert with all of the community of life supporting them, people know what they need to do. And it may not have a intact community to leave from and come back to, but people can still deeply mark and successfully, I'd say, navigate those kinds of changes within themselves. And the beauty of nature's mirror to show us what we need to see much more often than what we want to see and to give it to us in the simplest terms and the most direct feedback has just been one of the great gifts of my life to get to watch over and over again the way that conversation unfolds for people. And I have just innate trust at this point that if we go humbly and respectfully with our questions, with our prayers, with our longings, that we will be met because we are it and it is us. And that conversation is just aching to be remembered in, in a world that has been taught to forget it. A lot of the rites of passage work that I've done has been through my priestess trainings and like the the woman's work that I've done and I'm curious you know when I met you you were chairing a panel on sacred masculinity and I wondered what you wanted to share about your journey with that mm. aspect of yourself mm. The first thing I would say is that there's been a lot of unlearning there, a lot of unlearning of what manhood and masculinity was taught to me to look like, was showed to me to look like. It's so rooted in the myths of separation and domination and inequity. It's just painful. So 
I mean, I again have to just be so grateful for the chance to work and find meaningful work in, you know, unbroken ecosystems, in places where the conversation with the more than human world was possible. And there's a lot of ways to get to those, you know, underneath those stories of unhealthy masculinity. Mine was through nature, primarily. And, you know, just finding the way to simply situate myself appropriately in the family of things and recognize that like, well, I am not what they taught me I was, you know? At best, I'm a steward, you know? Uh, not a king and not a lord over, but like a, a humble <laughs> caretaker in a, in a, in like a very beautiful, web of relationships. And so that right there, that orientation so deeply changes manhood or masculinity from what I was taught it to be. Some things are similar, like I can imagine the archetype of protection still feeling very strong um, within the role of a steward or a caretaker and the archetypes of responsibility Strong, still strong there. But I think that, you know, what is so needed and available if we give ourselves to it for a lot of men or masculine identified people in the industrial growth society is opportunities to humble ourselves, to get on our knees and remember what we're actually made of and what we're actually here to do and give ourselves back in service to life. And we want it. We want it deeply. We don't know a lot of the times that we want it, but like it is a surrender that actually is, it's exquisite. And it also stops cycles of harm that have been perpetuating themselves for, you know, 10,000 years. So in addition to stopping that cycle, hallelujah, we need that, it actually is really good for us too, as men. So, boy, I'd love to have a lot of people hear that and actually get it. And I've had the chance to be in circles of men and masculine identified people and do that work and watch the walls decompose and break down and the feeling begin to emerge again and the vulnerability and communication start to happen and the remembering of ourselves as like whole beings. It's like, again, this word surrender just comes over and over. It's like such an exquisite surrender. It's so necessary. And it allows us our wholeness again. That's beautiful. Thank you. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was going to say you're welcome, but I don't know that I... I'm just lucky to get to have that experience in my life. So I'm grateful too. It makes me curious what you think or what you felt through the I don't know what your training in initiation has been but you mentioned priestess work and if you have any similar similar is maybe not the right word but you know your take on both perhaps what it's been for you to encounter womanhood femininity through that work mm. and also if there's any if you're willing insight or message that you would offer to 
men or masculine identified people from that lens. The thing that I have experienced the most in myself and also witnessed the most in other women or those that identify as women on these retreats, gatherings, pilgrimages, is it's really a sense of power. And I think that that's just the thing that's got trampled on the most in, in a patriarchal history. And I watch women turn up ashamed of who they are, ashamed of the potency, making everything small, encountering, witnessing a woman like reveal and feel that wildness and that aliveness and that, yeah, it's like the power of the cycles that we go through. So one thing that I started telling people like when I'm like meeting them, oh, I'm on my cycle now. And some one of my male friends was saying, ah, oh, you're you're one of three women that recently has been telling me that when when we're in conversation. Mm. And it's part of being able to honor that. So I'm on my cycle right now. And you know, I just have this like it's the new moon and I'm on my cycle and I just feel like ah, you mm-hmm. know, and there's these fires burning <laughs> and I can feel so much in my body right now and I feel so like powerful and then like close to the edge of tears Mm -hmm. and and that's like the feeling of this moment and in two days I'm going to feel very different to that and then two days after that very very different to that Mm. and watching that being honored and understood not as a burden, not as something that is annoying, that's like uncomfortable, that is, that means, oh, I'm not going to be able to perform how I'm expected to, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but actually being able to harness like what is the nature that I am saying <laughs> like yes. right now yes <laughs> and yeah I mean there's more things but that's enough right because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot and it's more than enough so for men that are listening stop telling us that we're crazy if we've got PMS or like stop labeling us or stop expecting us to be the same every day. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like come on the adventure mm. and <laughs> like honor and allow those cycles because they're there for all of us. Women, the ones that can give birth to new human beings would not be designed this way if it didn't have a deeper function in evolution right yes there's so much potential that's being lost because we don't honor that as women and because men don't honor it in women Mm. and so if we're able to actually pay more attention to those cycles to whatever is coming through if we're allowed to be wilder if we're allowed to be less pretty you know if we're allowed to be louder sometimes Mm -hmm. and very silent to others, you know? Yeah, if that stops being scary and instead becomes a real invitation into the adventure of this life, then just that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that. I'm with you. Yeah, I felt that. Thank you yeah. for being with me. Yeah. It's maybe one of the most important things that could possibly happen right now and is happening right now. Is the invitation that you just made. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, it's like, because in my life, this invitation isn't being met fully and it feels really lonely at times mm. because I know what it feels like when that's met in community or in a relationship. And it makes being a human, being alive, being on this planet, like so much more worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm tired of people running away. Mm. Um, men running away, women running away because they aren't yet willing to face that intensity in themselves. Mm. Yeah. I just, I just want to invite all of us to be wilder. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, and we see what happens, right? When we don't when we don't face it in ourselves, that intensity or other intensities, it comes out sideways. It comes out in atrocities and wildfires and mass shootings. And we could go down that list. We don't, I don't think we need to. I think people know what we're talking about. So may we remember. Yeah. And part of I, the practice is just not to shut that down when you encounter it in somebody else. Mm -hmm. And not to feel like it has a time and a place. Right. <laughs> like, you know, right. on a Saturday at 8 p.m., you may express wildness. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the shackles of linearity are certainly on us a lot of the time and none of what you just spoke about exists within that framework it can't mm. it can't thank you Is there anything else you want to say or ask before we close? What's with me as the feeling in the room as a result of this conversation that we've been in is the a palpable sense of this word that I think needs a lot of reclamation, which is magic. And along with it, maybe mystery. And for me, what that touches when we're really talking about reclaiming it is not, I think magic has been often trivialized into tricks and things like that but really in its deeper in its deeper roots you know it's it is the huh. i don't know if, if our friends will be able to hear that in the background but <laughs> some wild singing yes <laughs> just <to emerge>. exactly <laughs> <laughs> perfectly on time yeah yeah the way that the fabric of non-linear interconnected reality that is operating all the time every moment inescapable yesterday Joanna Macy said you're part of a web that it is impossible to fall out of. And so the to remember the web as the foundational fabric of, of what 
life on this planet is about. I think there's direction um, for us. I think there's instruction and hope and possibility for us if we remember the web and the subtle and synchronistic ways that it reveals itself to us. And our minds won't come up with that. You know, it gets under our thinking, which is so important right now. And it gets into our wildness and into our bodies and into our memory of being a body within a greater body. And it feels thick in the room to me right now. And so that's why I, I'm not sure if this is a closing comment or an opening comment. (laughs) I'm not sure if this is a wrap up or an invitation into where do we go from here, but it's what is evoked now. I suppose that's my uh, clopening comment. Yeah. Closing always is an opening. Yeah, clopening that came from a young friend who was on a long trip that we went on looking for new ways of being responsible humans on the planet. His name is Sam Dabosky. And recognizing that every time we close something, we're opening something else. And so he came up with clopening. So my comments are clopening comments today. Thank you. Yeah. What's my clopening today? Hmm. Well, I have a wild invitation Hmm. for our listeners. That's exciting. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder what it is. I am looking for a partner. Yeah, maybe somebody listening knows somebody or maybe somebody's listening and (laughs) says yes I can get down with that kind of wildness so I'm just going to put that out into the ether wow I don't care where in the world this man is wow but feel free to write in if you know him you hear that people (laughs) dang Didn't see that coming. Amazing. (laughs) This podcast is about to get super popular. (laughs) There's going to be so many people writing in. Watch out. All right. Well, you brought the magic in. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, put it to use. There's no shortage. It's inexhaustible. That's true. Yeah. The more we use it, the more there is. Yeah. It's not like fossil fuels. No, it's not. It's not. Thank you, Will, for making time today. Yeah. And for showing up. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been quite uh, an honor and just delightful. Really appreciate it. And so if we want to get in touch with you, it's weavingearth.org. Mm-hmm. Yeah, weavingearth.org. Easy. And we'll put links as well to everything else that's been mentioned. And yeah, and really hope that by the time this show airs, that you and your whole community are back in your houses mm. with as little damage to to the wild and to mm-hmm. everything as possible. Yeah, thank you. I hope that too. Thank you for spending your precious time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible with you, our community. If you loved this and would like to fund our show with a monthly donation or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co 
and click on community and support. Please also share with friends, hit subscribe and leave us a review so we can grow. Those gold stars really help others find us so these ideas can spread. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together. The Future is Beautiful is made by an all-female team working voluntarily or on reduced rates until our listener support grows. If you have been moved by anything you heard here, please donate the equivalent of buying us a drink. All donations make a huge difference to us and will allow us to keep doing this and remain advertising free. Until next time, I leave you with this question. How will you create beauty in the world?